Hello friends and welcome to my channel. This is Kavisha Lagya. Today we shall discuss one of the most important work of modernist literature and T.S. Eliot's magnum opus, The West Land. Don't worry if you are unaware of the modernist movement in English literature. In this video, by studying The West Land, you will certainly get an idea and features of modern poetry. So here we go with the basic introduction of the poet. The 20th century witnessed the emergence of a great American poet who made immense contribution in the field of modern poetry. Critic, essayist, poet and playwright Thomas Stearns Eliot was born in St. Louis, Missouri on 26 September 1888 to a prominent Boston Brahmin family. That is to say, elite family. Eliot's paternal grandfather, William Greenleaf Eliot, had established a city's Unitarian church. Raised by Unitarian family values and an Irish Catholic nurse named Anne Dunn, as well as teachers like conservative moralists George Santayana and Erwin Papik, Eliot had a very contrary influence which can be observed in his poetry especially in the Westland, where high and low dialects, popular and classical culture are contrasted. He had announced that he was a classist in literature, a royalist in politics, and Anglo-Catholic in religion. He was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1948 for his outstanding pioneer contribution to present-day poetry. If we talk about his long poem titled The Westland, it was first published in 1922 in the Criterion in London and was later published in The Dial in US. The poem is heavily loaded with allusions and it is a collage of various images. It is dedicated to poet Ezra Pound who edited the original poetry and condensed it to 433 lines. As a result of great war and its disastrous effects, meaninglessness and nothingness begin to rule the literary world. Eliot quotes in his Westland that, I can connect nothing with nothing, which describes the dislocation of society after the First World War. Escapism was one of the features of modern literature, but not in the sense of the romantics who used to escape to nature, but here as per the observation of E. M. Foster, who ascribed two chief reasons for the escapism, among which one was boredom, disgust, indignation against the herd, the community, and the world. He stated that the community is a selfish and to further its own efficiency is a traitor to the side of human nature which expresses itself in solitude. So major writers and poets begin to compose works on esoteric subjects. Only a few or the elite were able to read and grasp the meaning of the passages or poems written by the authors and poets. We can observe this esotericness by reading a few initial lines of the poem. The April is the cruelest month, breeding lilacs out of the dead land, mixing memory and desire, stirring dull roots with spring rain. Winter kept us warm, covering earth in forgetful snow, feeding a little life with dried tubers. In short, the images and allusions were so filtered in the text that it became hard to find it with a common eye. Additionally, here is this intertextuality, means interconnection between similar or related works of literature that reflects and influences readers' interpretation of the text. The poet refers to the characters of other stories or myths. Like, we have seen the very first line of the April is the cruelest month. This alludes to Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. Eliot uses Chaucer's words but with contradiction. And friends, you would know this. The poem contains five parts and they are The Burial of the Dead, The Game of Jazz, 
a fire sermon, death by water, what the thunder. All this part for the contained sections, wherein the episodes weave a general theme or act like a rosary which concludes with a common theme, spiritual degradation and sexual perversion. Burial of the Dead starts with a speaker describing the striking landscapes, scenes that are April, winter, summer, summer, which seems surprising. Mari, a new speaker, describes her experience of freedom in the mountains. The perspective changes with the narration of the Hyacinth Girl. It has episodes from Richard Wagner's opera and Aldous Huxley's first novel's character, Madame Sussurfris, the famous clairvoyant, and the irony which the Elliot describes is the wisest woman in Europe. She makes a statement that is very important to note, Fear Death by Water, which later becomes the title of the fourth part. The last episode describes the scene of London bridges. Unreal city under the brown fog of winter dawn, a crowd flowed over London Bridge. The next is a game of chess. The first scene describes makeup room of a rich ar aristocratic lady, which follows the myth of Philomela and Procne. That then the poem has a dialogue between two nameless persons, a woman urging to think. The last is Lil's episode in the coffee shop, which concludes with the reference of the last words uttered by Ophelia in Shakespeare's Hamlet before she drones herself, like good night, ladies, good night, sweet ladies, good night. Good night. The third is the fire sermon. The fire sermon has visual images of River Thames, the episode of Fisher King and Holy Grail. It is at the pinnacle of part 3 that the narrator is introduced to us, Tiresias, who says, I, Tiresias, though blind, throbbing between two lives, old men with wrinkled female breast. Furthermore, mechanical and lawless relationships of the typist and the clerk is given here. This part concludes with the last page passage, which is the song of three daughters of Thames. The next is Death by Water. This part of the West Land refers to various associated connections of water with mortality and the theme of death by drowning. Cleavers, bones rise and fall suggesting the different stages of his youth and old age while he was living the The phrase Gentile or Jew is an invocation to all mankind. What the Thunder said, the fifth part, what the Thunder said has varied religious connotations. He who was living is dead now refers to Jesus Christ. The first scene is a landscape of stony places, frosty gardens, prisons. In short, surreal images are emerging in some of the stanzas like Who is the third who walks always beside you, the hooded man? The poet refers to River Ganges in India and here the title The Thunder is a message of Brihad Aranyaka Upanishad. And before that the falling towers of London are introduced. Like it's not only the year of Elliot mentioned but all the whole of the Europe, not only London. The three da which the thunder spoke. The first da is be a giver, contribute what you have. The second is dayatvam, emphasize with empathize with people. I have heard the key turn in the door once and turn once only. We think of 
the key each in his prison thinking of the key each conforms a prison in this stanza the prison and the key is metaphor that Eliot uses the key here is making sound and this sound is of the key being inserted in the lock and is turned once the sound is similar to the experience when we are all alone by ourselves and this sound is an alert what that we are in a prison and this pr prison is our self ego so the second emphasizes that empathize with people leave your self control the third one is practice self control the poem and with shanti 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 peace that passes all understanding hence right from the beginning like the epigraph of sibyl and throughout the poem eliot emphasizes a lot on spiritually this is culture and mechanical life of people the modern literature has this new narrative technique called the stream of consciousness T.S. Eliot's The West Land seems to be a stream of thought or collective memory of narrator in the past which constantly merges with the present. The mythical technique employed in the poem gives this poem a sense of beauty. So this is Eliot's greatest poem and The West Land which is certainly an influential work. This video is my humble attempt after attending online lectures of Professor Dr. Dilip Parsar. If you find this video interesting, please hit a like button. Thank you and have a nice day.